talking about um, aspects of metabolite identification and quantification. And this is this idea of going from spectra to lists. Um, so again, we're going to talk about spectral deconvolution. We're going to look at NMR, GCMS, and LCMS. And this is sort of a lead up to the lab that you're going to be doing this afternoon. Um, we're also going to be talking about databases um, and some of the techniques that are available now. So what we're trying to do in metabolomics is, at least initially, is to do something called metabolite annotation. It's not unlike gene annotation or protein annotation. Um, it's, it's, it's to look and to, to go from what might be the raw data that's on your left to something that is uh, annotated with uh, figures, labels, or a list that includes names and, and concentrations. Now, in genome annotation and proteome annotation, in fact, the, the tools have been around for a long, long time. So in genomics, um, we have BLAST, um, we have GenBank and NCBI. Uh, uh, we might take your raw DNA sequence um, or your RNA-seq data or your transcriptomic data, and you can get very quickly, based on the sequence, you can identify genes. Uh, there are tools gained for measuring, calculating transcript abundance, and so on. Proteomics, there are tools like Mascot, where you can take your, your mass spectra, upload that, and you can get your protein IDs. There are other things that can calculate relative concentration data based on peak abundance. Um, so whether it's tools like Mascot or Blast, and databases like GenBank or, or the other um, proteomics databases. But in metabolomics, for the longest time, if you took a, an HPLC, a GCMS, an LCMS, or an NMR spectrum, you uploaded that, you, you couldn't do anything. You couldn't get your metabolite IDs and concentrations. There wasn't a Blast or hasn't been a Blast for metabolomics. There hasn't been a Mascot for metabolomics. Um, and that was has been arguably still continues to be an issue for, for uh, metabolomics. In metabolomics, we use a term, the, the known unknowns and the unknown unknowns. And this is something, a credit to um, a quote with Donald Rumsfeld, I think, in 2001. And the quote's given here, and he was talking about what they didn't know about al-Qaeda in Afghanistan. And um, he kind of just dug himself a deep hole talking about known, known, and unknown, unknown, nuns, and he just... <laughs> but it was useful in the sense that in metabolomics, um, we're often dealing with a set of initially peaks, um, but in many cases, those peaks have already been characterized. People actually have the structures, they know the mass, they know the, the, the reference. It's just that we haven't found the reference. We haven't found the reference spectrum. We haven't got the compound in our library, whatever. Um, so in those cases, it is possible if you made a sufficiently large, sufficiently complicated or comprehensive uh, library, you could actually figure out those things. The unknown unknowns are the things that have never been characterized. They're not in the literature. No structure has ever been drawn on a blackboard or in a book uh, that describes this molecule. Um, so those are the truly novel ones, and these are sort of the things that metabolomics people dream of finding. Um, the problem is that, that there's probably only a handful in the world who've actually truly identified a completely novel compound, at least in the realm of metabolomics. Now there are natural product chemists who can usually put up a list on their wall of perhaps a dozen that they've identified in their lifetime. So truly novel compound identification is extremely difficult and time-consuming. And it has represented what we now know in terms of the few hundred thousand natural products that are listed in the Natural Product Dictionary, represents the cumulative effort of tens of thousands of scientists of over a hundred years. So you think of the number of scientists, the number of years, it, it translates to, you know, a few compounds per scientist over their lifetime. Um, so it's hard. So ultimately what we're trying to do in metabolomics is mostly identify the known unknowns. And that's what I'm going to talk about here, and we'll talk a little bit about the unknown unknowns. 
So the, the best way to deal with the known unknowns is a technique called spectral deconvolution. And this is essentially to match the peaks or known set of peaks from a database. So you can do spectral deconvolution for NMR, GCMS, LCMS, MS, MS. You could even do it for FTIR, all of the techniques. When you do spectral deconvolution, to some extent, it becomes a targeted technique because you're looking for things that um, you know, are, are known or are within your library. If you do the spectral deconvolution correctly, you can not only identify, you can also quantify. So that's a, an advantage. So we're going to talk about these techniques first for NMR. So again, this is the sort of the original metabolomic technique, so the history is longer. Um, and this is how they conceived it. If you look at the blue spectrum at the top, this is actually a, a, a mixture of compounds. So it produces a bunch of peaks. In this case, they're not overlapping. They're all separable. Now, if you didn't know any better, you might think that that spectrum is one compound. But if someone tells you, no, there's a mixture, then it's possible to look through a library of known spectra. In this case, uh, let's say our library has three spectra in it. You can see how, by summing the purple, the green, and the red together, you can come up with the blue spectrum. So that's sort of the forward. The reverse is, how do you take the blue spectrum and deconvolve it into those three compounds? That's a little harder. That's an inverse problem, which is computationally challenging. Even for humans, it's hard to conceive. But you can see how these things sum together. So that's going up, and then coming back down is the deconvolution one. So there is software, actually, that allows you to do this. Uh, there's a company actually based in Edmonton called Konomics, and they developed uh, one of the first software tools to do spectral deconvolution. And it's used quite widely. Uh, we used to teach um, a course with the software. Um, and they have demos that you can download that allow you to do this, so feel free to do that. What you're seeing here is they have an NMR spectrum, and you can see where this sort of reddish hued peak is, I said, or collection of peaks is identifying the, the compound that's sort of hidden under all these other peaks. You can also see a list below that which gives you the, the names of the compounds and actually their concentrations, I think, if you expand it, of all the compounds that are found in this serum spectrum. So there's about 50 compounds, and a person who's reasonably skilled can actually, in about half an hour, 40 minutes, identify all these 50 compounds by deconvolution. Not only do they identify, they quantify them. So to use that for NMR, you have to do some manual work. You have to do that, that fixing step where I talked about phasing, where you get the peaks pointing up in the right direction. You transform them using the Fourier transform. You remove the water signal, which is uh, a special uh, frequency uh, deletion technique. You perform this baseline correction so things aren't shifted or wobbly. You reference. Um, and then you use this guess and check technique, which is maybe the old way you might have learned how to do algebra or something. but. It's the same thing with NMR. here. Hmm, this peak looks like it's a lot like a uh, lactate. I'll slide in a lactate peak and see if I can move it around. And there's other lactate peaks, and you'll shift it up and down. It's like, this fits, or no, it doesn't fit. I'll try another one, and maybe I'll try acetate and put that one in. So that guess and check, the superposition, you're using your mouse to drag things scaling up and down. And as I say, it's, it takes half an hour to 40 minutes if you're skilled. Again, we used to have people try and do this. Um, but we had problems. Uh, Jeff can probably attest to it, but we'd only typically get people to, to fix or identify about three compounds after our, our lab session, and most people guessed wrong. So it, it, it wasn't great, um, but the people that have taken the time to, to learn it actually are quite proficient, and that's just like you know, learning chess or something. If you, if you take the time, you can get pretty good at it. So there are other tools that have come along where they've been trying to make this more automatic. Um, Brooker is an NMR company. Um, they have a tool called Amix. They also have a thing that's, that does juice and wine screening. So you can take your favorite wine and have it automatically analyzed. Uh, 
if you've got a million dollars, uh, to get your instrument. Um, but it, it's bundled free with the software. And it's actually used for, for determining where things are, which source of the wine, source of the juices that are used in, in, and sold in Europe. There is a wine screen, I think, in BC at Simon Fraser. And then there's um, other efforts that have gone on which are more open source, uh, an effort in Imperial College called Batman, which is automated deconvolution, and then one called Basil, which you guys will learn today, for automated deconvolution. So when you do automatic metabolomics, and this is what we're going to try and introduce you guys, you guys to, is that it is possible to automate a lot of the, the flow in, in, in metabolomics. So instead of 30 or 40 minutes, it's about a minute. So it's 30 to 60 times faster. Um, in terms of performance, precision, recall, um, compared to an expert human, it, it seems to be about as good as an expert human. But because it's automatic, you can just go home and let it process dozens to hundreds of spectra overnight. When you let a computer do it, it's reproducible. So even if it's wrong, it's reproducibly wrong. Um, when a human's doing it, they might say, oh, I think I'm feeling this way today, so I'll do it this way. And, and so the reproducibility is, is not great. So the bias or user errors is, is sort of eliminated. And in, in some cases, we found that, that the automated methods actually pick up things that people just ignore, either because they are trained to ignore it or, or they're tired and, and choose to ignore it. Um, so the Batman um, is, as I say, it's a free software package that you can um, download and install for doing NMR um, metabolomics. Um, they've written papers on it, um, on how to use it. It's, it's quite slow. Um, and it's actually slower than a human. So at some level, it's not, there isn't a, a real benefit to it yet. Um, and it's somewhat limited in terms of the number of compounds it can detect. Um, so because of those issues, um, we worked on another tool called basil. So it's pronounced like the spice, but it uses Bayesian um, theories to help with the deconvolution. So it's web-based. Um, so as you said, it's very accurate. Um, the, the Bayesian components using the hidden Markov models. Some of you may have heard of hidden Markov models. These are used for speech and language detection, recognition. They're also used in sequence alignment. But they're great for detecting patterns. And really what you are doing is, is a pattern fitting process. It, it, when, when we watch it perform, it actually seems to perform very similar to the way human does it. So it's, it's mimicking. So it's learned how to do it, or it's mimicking what humans do in terms of pattern recognition. It also requires some prior knowledge. Again, this is part of the Bayesian thing, is you have to be able to tell it that this is a spectrum of blood, or this is a spectrum of cerebral spinal fluid, or a cell extract. If you tell it the wrong thing, it'll do pretty badly. But it's the same sort of thing if you tell a human that what you're analyzing is this, and in fact it was something completely different. You know, aha, I fooled you. Yeah, everyone will get as just a computer will also get confused. So it knows what it has to look for and we'll try to fit that. The other thing that was really important was to try and automate all of these manual processes that are typically done in NMR. So manually people will phase, which is getting peaks to point up. Manually people will reference so that they know where the, the zero mark is. Manually people will remove water and they will manually perform baseline correction, which is kind of like aligning or moving a picture so it's straight and everyone has a slightly different view of what's straight. Um, so if you automate those things, then it's consistent. And that was, I think, a critical thing. And that's not actually in most other or any other tools we know of. Yes? So the 95% accuracy is comparable with the manual method? It is. Humans are imperfect, and, and so they'll misidentify. Uh, an expert will misidentify at about a rate of 5%. So this is an example of a portion of an NMR spectrum. And you, know, you guys can see maybe a few dozen peaks there, uh, which is the, the overlaid component for the spectrum. But um, underneath are the detected compounds. And you can see how these all sum up. And so it, when you're dealing with 90 or 150 compounds, it gets really complicated. And there's sort of an expert threshold, just like with a chess grandmaster with a chess amateur. 
certain people can do up to maybe 30, some people can do up to 50. It's maybe only a handful of people walking around the world that can do more than about 100, just because it becomes so complicated and they have to know so much. But this is what Basil is able to do. Um, and then this is some earlier tests, but this is you know where human was doing the fitting. So there's the black spectrum, which is the actual spectrum. The red is the fit, where they do that spectral deconvolution. So it takes them about 40, 45 minutes. If you're an expert, if we gave it to you guys, it would be four or five days. Um, and then the computer, um, this is five minutes now. It's, it's running about a minute, I think, now. So it, it's, it's obviously much faster. Uh, this is the website. Uh, you guys will see that later today. Um, and um, you can log in to it. We're going to be logging into a, a version which can accommodate sort of 25 hits at once. Um, and, and we'll sort of take you through some of that, that operation. It's also a freely open accessible website, so you don't have to log in on the regular version. So the, the e URL that is publicly available is, is free. Um, what you'll do is um, you'll fill in things like the, because um, it's too small for me to read here. <laughs> um, you'll choose a spectrum. Um, you'll put in how much of your reference compound is, what's used to quantify. You have to choose what type of NMR you ran it on. There's a 500 megahertz NMR. There's a 600 megahertz NMR. I think we've got a 7 me 700 megahertz, I hope. <laughs> coming online this week. Um, and, um, and then there's example ones that you can just kind of run. So if you clicked on just an example to see how does it perform, um, what you would get is you first upload your spectrum. And it does what's called a Fourier transformation. So it takes the, the raw signal it gets from the NMR, which is just this wavy collection of peaks, and it converts it from a uh, time domain to a frequency domain. And so that's the spectrum you get. So you have all of these distorted peaks all over the place. But the Fourier transform is done very quickly. So then you do a phasing, or Basil does the phasing. So it tries to get the peaks all pointing up. So you can see how they were at the top, they're dispersive. Now at the bottom, they're absorptive is the term. But you can also see somewhere in the middle, this is where the water signal is. And there's a distortion that happens. Um, so you can see it dipping and it's kind of messed up in the middle there. So then it has to do a, a couple other things. So it's going to fix the water signal, it's going to re, uh, redo the baseline so that things are more balanced, and then it's going to find the zero point, um, which is the referencing. So that takes about, in this case, 30 seconds. As I say, it's much faster now. Um, so this is the final spectrum. This was done automatically by the software. Normally it's done by a human, but it varies. So if we had the 20 of you trying to do this, every one of you would come up with a slightly different looking spectrum. If they're all different, then the deconvolution process will lead to different results. So if you do it in an, in an automated way, that's reproducible. Now it, it might not be perfect, but this is it's going to do it at the same time every time for the next 50 years. So that's that makes it reliable. So about a minute later, it will have then deconvolved that spectrum. And so you see, you can see a faint blue. So this is the fitting that it's done. So as I said, it would have taken you guys a couple days. This has done this in about a minute. Um, and it's now fit every single peak. And if you click or scroll down a little further, here are all of the compounds that I identified and all of their concentrations along with an estimate of the confidence. So this is automated metabolomics. You can go to an NMR instrument and it will automatically load your samples, just like an auto sampler, hundreds at a time. All the spectra will be collected. They can all be directly fed into Basil individually or in batches. And then you can have it just run and it'll just generate your list. Question. Just a tiny question, um, just so I know for myself. Um, the Bayesian part is in this processing before deconvolution also, right? 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's a little bit of Bayesian work. It's more. <laughs> it's a mix. Um, there'll be some very subtle differences each time. Um, it, it uses uh, sort of a seeding, uh, which is a bit randomized to identify or play out where some of the peaks could be. Um, it should largely converge to basically the same answer. There'll be subtle differences in maybe the concentrations of very low, very, very low concentration values. Um, but um, yeah, for the most part, it's it's exactly reproducible. Um, the fits, the numbers, as I say, might differ by you know 0.1 percent or something like that. You can run it for short periods, or you can run it for long periods. Uh, so depending on how long you let it fit, you can end up with different answers. So if, as long as you run it for this, uh, they call it the slow or fast version. So if you, you know, flip back and forth between your slow and fast versions randomly, then you'll end up with sort of inconsistent data. So just use exactly the same method. Longer is better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but some people don't have the time or whatever, so... Um, it'll always be better. It's always better. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of a minimization if you can think about it, or an optimization. So you're getting better, and if you could run it forever, it would, you know. But it, it's a it's a very complex, multi-hyper-dimensional optimization, and um, those almost never converge perfectly. And then that's sort of what you're ending up with. Could, could you run it again and again? Like, on the same thing? Like, a, I mean, I wouldn't put a Monte Carlo on it, but, you know, you could do it a few times, and just to... Yeah, you could. Um, um, as I say, it'll always converge as long as you're running it in the same algorithm. You can. Um, we we just have it as a web server. Uh, there's only one person who actually understands the theory for this, <laughs> and he's doing a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon. So, um, we've tried to figure it out uh, ourselves um, to, to to deal with it. But most of what we can do are just sort of subtle changes. Um, the um, it fits according to area as opposed to the peak. And so humans tend to fit to the peak. Um, and so that's been a, an issue for us. So we're, we're rewriting it to see if we can get it to fit to the peak, which is more understandable. Uh, but that's, you know, get, delves into a lot of complicated math. Anyways, the, um, there are limitations with this approach. So it works for simple biofluids. So we've structured it for serum, plasma, and CSF, but that basically covers any uh, mammalian substance, basically, um, except for urine. So we've tried for three years to get it to work for urine. It doesn't. Urine is much too complicated. Um, it works at 500 and 600 megahertz, and then a 700 megahertz one is basically done. And so that should be up sometime, I hope, in the next week or two. Um, those are the common NMR instruments, so it's fairly generic. So if most of you have never done NMR, but if you have colleagues, they will have these types of instruments, and so it's very doable. It's descriptions on how to prepare the sample, and this is what we realized in the course of doing this. There's many ways that people can prepare samples and many ways they can collect spectra in NMR. You have to standardize that. If you don't, then none of the automation will work. Just like with GCMS, they have standardized it. And so this is, we've proposed a standard which is pretty generic. Many people standardly use it. This pulse sequence is very simple. Um, as I say, the, there's been a speed up, so the, it's down to, I don't know, more like two minutes instead of five to seven minutes. Um, and then the open website uh, that everyone can access allows you to do just a single spectrum at a time. Um, you guys will be using one that I think should be able to do batch versions. And then there's a, um, I guess we'll call it a commercial version, but it's more essentially a, a not-for-profit not version where you can get 
the, a whole bunch of the material uh, to do the sample preparation uh, bundled in a kit and then you get the software that allows you to do much more interactive work. So this one does it automatically but some people want to tweak things and so that's okay and so that's what this um, this other semi-commercial version does. So that's Basil. We're going to try it later this afternoon. Um, now we're going to talk about GCMS and then LCMS. So conceptually, GCMS, LCMS is also sort of a spectral deconvolution process. You start off with a chromatogram, which is shown up on the upper left corner. Under that chromatogram, you're going to find um, usually one, two, three more peaks or compounds underneath that sum to produce um, the, the observed peak. With EI, you're going to get this fragmentation pattern, and you're going to look at, from the extracted ions, you'll see different EI MS spectra. So we've got a blue, a red, and a green one. When you've pulled those out, whatever software you're using, you're now going to do a library analysis, and you're going to deconvolve them. So on the far right is your library. And your, I, the idea is to see if you can match that library, your observed spectrum, to the library spectrum. So I think we only had one person doing it anymore. How many people do GCMS for their metabolomics? One, two, three-ish. <laughs> okay. Um, so in this case, um, critical thing obviously is the database. The other thing to remember is that EI is a hard fragmentation method, so it shatters um, your, your, spec your compounds to produce a spectrum that is not unlike an NMR spectrum because these peaks are fingerprints. They're characteristic of that molecule, unique to it. So they're typically going to be a high mass peak, which will be your molecular ion, your parent ion. The fragmentation patterns some cases are predictable, although it's, it's hard for most things. The intensities are impossible to predict. But here's another GCMS mass spectrum. We see the parent ion. Sometimes things maybe have adducts, but most cases don't. And then you see the fragment or daughter ions. And the position of those daughter ions is telling you what the fragments are. In many cases, with GCMS, the compounds are derivatized. So most commonly it's trimethylsilane, but you can get TBDMS and methoxine. These are extra atomic molecular groups that will um, attach onto hydroxyl groups or others. Um, and they will add specific masses. And in some cases, by looking at these mass increments or mass changes, you can then say, oh, well, this is. Um, TMS derivative, or this has got two TMS, or three TMS, or two T TDBMSs, or three methoxines. That helps in some cases to identify things. Um, in the case for GCMS, um, whereas for NMR it's many polar metabolites, uh, GCMS you will see polar metabolites, but it's often best used for organic acids and for volatiles. Um, as we talked about the gas chromatography, the plate count is much better than LC. EIMS is standardized, so that means that you can use libraries of EIMS spectra. And the route that most people use to identify compounds is to use a software tool called AMDIS and a database called NIST, the National Institute for Standards. So the NIST database is an amazing database. It trumps all other metabolomic spectral databases by many fold. So there's almost 300,000 electron impact spectra and almost a quarter million compounds. Compared to LCMS databases which typically have probably less than 12,000 unique compounds. So GCMS, EIMS um, is, is 20 times better. Um, it does have ion trap data as well, and QTOF and triple quad data as well. Um, 
again, very rich source. Um, it costs some money, um, but it's overall relatively cheap. It also has retention index values, which in the case of GCMS is a very reproducible, very useful way for identifying compounds. It's an orthogonal measure. And uh, again, if LCMS had this, it would be so much easier. But it's all in GCMS, and this is one reason why I think it's, it's a neglected, but probably a far more useful technique for, for metabolomics than, than most people realize. This is um, sort of the software tools that couple with AMDIS um, and, and it's more just to indicate the sort of interface you, you can work with and the way that you can identify and score um, whether you've got a similar or, un, or, or an exact match. That software, the AMDIS um, um, slash NIST tool, um, has a number of, of features that will allow it to uh, extract and identify things. It, it gets rid of background noise. It compares peaks so that it can identify which ones are noise peaks and which ones are real peaks. It'll generate a clean spectrum, sort of that deconvolution, not unlike what we talked about for NMR. And then it'll go through the library and use what's called the match factor, which identifies or scores the similarity between peaks or spectra. So you have your experimental MS spectrum, your extracted MS, and then you have the library, and that's your reference library. And this is how the match factor is, is calculated. It's sort of a, it's a dot product of spectral intensity and position. So how you compare vectors, if you remember dot products, and then it's scaled by a thousand. So the best you could possibly do is get a thousand for your match factor. Generally the cutoff is about 700, some people use 800 and above. So if you get a match of 800 or 700 above, then that's probably your compound. So there's a protocol for GCMS. Um, typically, if you want to use retention index information and you want to quantify, you prepare a, an external set of standards. These are alkanes, and these are things to, 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 to calibrate your retention times, so you can get a retention index. Also, you typically have to run a blank sample because you do this derivatization step. There's always derivatization junk that shows up. And so this blank sample allows you to pick up things that are both stuck to your column that are always coming off, as well as sort of the chemical sets that, that typically show up. And then from there you watch your samples of interest, uh, which are obviously run in the same conditions as the blank. So here's a set of standards run through your GC, and you can see how evenly spaced they are and their positions they come off in. And from that, you can normalize your retention times to retention indices. So this is, you know, again, if only we could do this for LCMS, but GCMS it is very feasible. The so calibration files are done. Um, you calibrate, calculate, or recalculate your RIs. And then you start searching after you've got your sample files in this database is for matches. Uh, you might be able to get rid of some false positives by comparing your blank. So this is this, this AMDIS protocol where you know, here's your calibration file, load it up. Here's your calibration, step two. Step three is searching your NIST database so after things have all been calibrated. And this is the sort of interface that, that AMDIS provides. And you can see things that are marked in red and yellow and blue are indicating the positions of certain peaks and where what's marked in red is, is sort of this, this particular peak that's come off the chromatogram. So we'll zoom in a little bit and we can see, um, you know, here's the peak that you've isolated with the, the AMDIS software. Zoom it out and you can see a, a yellow, white, uh, I guess it should be yellow, blue, and red. And below that, you're seeing what AMDIS is trying to match. And it has calculated that what's, what it's seeing based on the positions of these masses, the M over Z values, there's a 73 and a 144, sort of from the extracted chromatogram. 
and it has got a match factor of 840, sometimes it's reported as a percentage, or 84%, to the reference spectrum of valine. So this peak through the AMDIS software has now been identified as, as valine, and you could double check it to see the retention index matches to what's reported in the database, and probably does. And then if you've done some calibrations, you can also quantify it. So this is sort of a, again, a 30,000 foot view of how to do AMDIS, um, but it, it is something that allows you to identify and deconvolve. So not unlike basal, but it's not automatic. You have to click and, and choose and, and um, process things. What we're going to show you guys is an automatic way to do what's done in AMDIS, and that's called GC AutoFit. There are also other programs, commercial ones, Analyzer Pro and Chromatoff for examples. Um, they've been compared uh, between AMDIS, Analyzer Pro, Chromatoff in about five or six years ago, now seven years ago. Um, and then there's also different databases you can use. Uh, so every three or four years NIST releases databases, so another one's due in 2017, but there's the GOLM database, and then the Oliver Fien has also developed a, a database for GCMS. So as I say, you guys are going to use GC AutoFit. Um, so like Bazel, uh, it tries to do everything automatically, but it's aligned with how most people typically do GCMS. So it needs your sample. You know, well, it needs your standards, which does the retention index, but also helps with the calibration of intensities, and it needs a blank. Um, so it does all of the things that you would do normally manually through, through the, the AMDIS NIST thing. So it will do auto alignment, it'll identify the peaks, uh, peak picking, it'll do the integration, calculate the concentration. It'll take a bunch of different files, the time actually, I think, is now less than sixty seconds. I'm not sure what you, when you've tried it, Jeff, how long it took. Yeah. So batches will take longer, but it's proportional to the number of, of things. You can identify uh, in our hands up to about 119, 120 compounds. And it's, it's very accurate. Actually, it's more accurate than basal. Um, yeah? Uh, so is this the URL in the spectrum that we're working with? Do you use gcms.h or like what? Because gcms won't use the spectrum.html. So they've changed, we've changed it for this? Yes. OK. So yeah, there's. Write that down so you won't end up going to the, the wrong version. Uh, the, I think, again, we've tried to do this because we're going to be dealing with a lot of heavy load. And so we've created sort of mirror sites so that we aren't going to bring it down for the rest of the world. Um, so as I said, the three standard files that everyone has to do, typically the alkane standard, a blank sample, usually recommended, and then obviously the samples you're analyzing. So those are the three files. Um, it will support uh, various conversions. There's also conversion mm -hmm. software that allow people to, to switch back and forth. Again, this is just a function of different instruments produce different file formats. Uh, you can upload a single file. You can upload a zipped file of a whole bunch of ones. So that's why it would take potentially longer. So you can ch choose either a standard one or, or a zip file with a collection of those spectra. Like basal, you have to be able to tell it what your sample is. So if it really is serum, but you said saliva, it'll do a bad job. Um, so make sure you align it with what it really is. So in this case, you have uh, serum, urine, saliva, and this current collection that you guys will be using. People can also upload at their own library for a specific biofluid or extract. Um, and then there'll be sort of a calibration uh, internal standards for quantification. It can do everything automatically. You can sort of stop just to make sure is it is it doing it right so you can see what's been happening. Um, so you can look to see if your standards look 
right. Uh, it'll pop up your sample spectrum just to see if it looks right. Um, and then it'll crunch away for a few seconds and then spit out um, the output. So it'll mark things off in terms of the peaks it's identified, and it'll identify uh, specific compounds and provide some connotation. And then that can also be exported as a uh, Excel format or CSV format for, for identifying the samples. In some cases it'll see multiple peaks and it'll merge those peaks to calculate a, a summed concentration for that particular compound. So you can see the table or you can see the spectrum to just sort of see if it all makes sense to you. So both with Basil and GC Autofit, this is, these are attempts to make it fully automated. Now in GCMS, efforts for, for full automation were done in the 70s actually. Um, but um, it was it varied or they do it and it would work for one computer platform which became obsolete within a year and they just didn't bother to, to, to do it again. Um, and so surprisingly the vendors don't offer automation which is weird and it's also weird that um, the folks that developed Amdis or, Bas or, or NIST have, haven't really tried to do it either. Um, one of the reasons as well that we're trying to do this automatically is, is we found in the, this course that if we tried people to say, okay, why don't you try and run Amdis, um, you know, three hours later they maybe fit one compound and they say, well, what did I accomplish? And the same with the economics, three hours later they fit three compounds. And so you didn't really sort of learn a whole lot. Now, the reason why we've done the automation is partly to see, well, in the end, is that compound identification should not be the most time-consuming part of metabolomics. It, it's the data interpretation. It's what you guys have trained to do or learned, which is to interpret that data, to understand the biochemistry, the biology, the physiology. Um, but it's also to try and make it standard and to make it consistent. And, and that's been, I think, another problem with metabolomics is that there's, there hasn't been a lot of consistency and very little standardization. Efforts towards standardizing come out of, of the metabolomic society where they've been proposing these ideas for um, metabolite identification at different levels. Um, level one being positively identified compounds which are confirmed by a match to a known standard, even an authentic compound, or a large collection of spectra that say this is definitely there. Most people actually don't achieve level one identification. In most cases people are at level two, which is identifying compounds based to a, a match to a spectrum. In some cases it's an M over Z and a retention time, or retention takes sometimes it's an EIMS or an MSMS and a retention time. Uh, a large majority of compounds are, are putatively identified as, as just sort of belonging to a certain class, that's primary lipids. <coughs> And then 97% of things from LCMS are in the unknown category. So we'll jump now to LCMS. And if this figure looks just identical to GCMS, it is. Because in large part, they are very similar. Now in most cases with LCMS, people will stop only at the parent ion. They won't go on to get the MSMS -MS spectra. Um, this is depicting, assuming that you've gone on to get not only the paradigm, but also the MSMS spectrum, <coughs> some sort of swath or data independent acquisition method. So again, you've got, you know, uh, MSMS data, fragmentation data, it allows you to do some database comparisons and aligning those things. There's a lot of commercial tools for that unlike GCMS and unlike NMR. So every manufacturer has their own. Every manufacturer wants to have you use their own. So how many of you use LCMS for your metabolomics? So the majority of you. And how many people use commercial tools for those? Small number. There are free options. Uh, so how many of you use XCMS for your work with LCMS? Only one, two. How many have ever used MZMine? How many have ever heard of it? 
Um, and there's a few others that are appearing, but um, we're going to maybe use XCMS. I don't know. The, the website went down today. <laughs> so this is the problem uh, with, with online, especially with MSMS software. We're limited and we can't buy the commercial packages install it on everyone's computer. So we're largely trying to use open access online tools for this. So XMS was one that last year worked okay, uh, and up till a day ago was working fine. <laughs> and uh, we're at the mercy of UC San Diego supercomputers. So XMS actually is uh, um, an open source tool. Um, it does a lot of the things that you need to do with, with mass spec. It does the peak picking, peak matching, retention time alignment. Uh, you can download it as an R package command line, and then the XMS online is a web server. It accepts a whole bunch of different formats, um, and it is linked to a well-known database called Metlin, which allows you to identify compounds. So it's very much sort of a chemometric and targeted uh, method. So this is where you take a whole bunch of spectra that you have got, um, you align them. So there's sort of a retention time, nonlinear alignment, and then you pick out the features. So there's a, a large peak picking component to, to XCMS, and it identifies which peaks are real, which ones are not, assesses them. Um, and then from there, from the identified extracted ion chromatograms, it identifies masses, and primarily does uh, compound identification on the parent ion mass, but will also attempt to do compound identification by the MSMS matching. The, the tough part, or the difficult computational part is the, is the peak detection. And there are different algorithms that different programs have developed, and there's no one universal answer. And ironically, the best peak pickers are, are the human eye. Um, we always beat, always trump computers. Um, but there are tools and tricks people have learned over the years to do things like certain types of filtering and, and deconvolution and certain algorithms that have been described. And so this is central to um, XCMS's um, success, really, in terms of the peak, peak detection. The other thing that happens uh, with liquid chromatography, um, because you're typically working with LCMS, uh, is to do peak alignments. So you've got a whole selection of, of chromatograms, and so now you want to make sure everything is aligned so that you know uh, where, where things are. Uh, XMS does this quite well, and that was another reason why it became quite popular. So you can see these unaligned chromatograms at the top, and then it, it warps, does the time warp uh, to try and get things nicely aligned. When they compared it, uh, this is seven years ago or more, um, to a number of other tools, Xaline and MZ mine and MZ inspect and so on, um, it it performed better than any others. Uh, more recent tools that have been released um, by Oliver Fiend's group um, have outperformed XCMS actually. And so there's a bit of a an arms race between the different groups to try and get improve things, which is good for everyone. This is the XCMS online. Uh, if you use Firefox, it works. If you use Chrome, it doesn't. And today, it doesn't work at all. Um, but if it was, uh, this is sort of how you'd, you'd go onto the, the website here. It's based out of scripts. It uses, I think, it clusters at the San Diego Supercomputer Center. Um, and what you do is you'll, you'll start a job. Um, and you can do different types, um, single jobs, pairwise jobs, <coughs> meta multi-group jobs, uh, depending on the type of, of whether it's groups or comparing groups or, or whatever you want to do. So again, that's relatively simple. You can upload your data. 
Um, so if there's two groups or two data sets, you'd upload them in two different panels. Upload your spectra. And again, these are just sort of stepping through if things were working. Um, so this, this again is just stepping you through how you would upload the, the spectra. Now, the challenge with LCMS and for an online server is that the data files are ridiculously large. In contrast with GCMS and NMR, files are ridiculously small. Um, so for NMR and GCMS, it's quite amenable to online. It's quite amenable to rapid processing. It's quite amenable to um, getting answers almost real time. I think in all likelihood, we, we're expecting XMS online to disappear in part because of the load, but also because the file sizes are getting so large they can't handle it. And the web can't handle it. Um, and it's ironic because I don't think there's that a whole lot more data um, really in, in LCMS files. So this is um, kind of ironic. Um, so after you've uploaded results, um, then you can set a variety of parameters. Um, in this case, the data set was from a single quad instrument and it used HPLC. So there's lots of different file formats. And then you let it run. And uh, last year, we overloaded the site, I think. So it took anywhere from half an hour to a couple of hours uh, for people to get results. But if it's on a quiet day, then you can get your job um, reasonably quickly. And then you can start clicking through the panels. So it's a really nicely designed website. Uh, it's just, as I say, limited by this bottleneck of, of huge, huge data files. Um, and then you can download your results as well in, in an X, uh, XML or Excel type format. And you've got your mass, peaks, identifiers, retention time, average intensity, individual peak intensities. So this is giving you your metabolite list. Now the problem is that there's a lot of false positives in XCMS still, and in most uh, things. The other point is that this is not giving you concentration data, it's relative intensity or relative concentration data. In some cases the peaks aren't identified, in many cases they aren't, the uh, vast majority they aren't. And so typically you'll have to um, identify or annotate compounds using other types of software or through more manual comparisons with MSMS data. For LCMS, um, because you primarily use reverse phase, um, generally more hydrophobic molecules are picked up. So more hydrophobic amino acids, hydrophobic organic acids or hydrophobic fatty acids. It's great for lipid analysis. If you can derivatize your compounds, as many people are starting to do, uh, for isotopic labeling and quantification. Also, this is enhanced with LCMS. Um, you need both the parent ion and the MSMS data to really uh, help identify things. The retention time can also help. Um, if you have very, very high mass accuracy, you can generally get um, reasonably good um, suggestive matches of what the compounds are. So if you have high mass accuracy, generally 1 ppm or better, so that's Orbitrap, FTMS, or really high quality QTOS, you can go to mass searches and start looking through uh, databases of compounds. A lot of people um, like to do this, uh, and a lot of people identify compounds just by parent ion searching. How many people use that approach for compound identification? A couple. Um, the, a lot of it depends on the databases you work with and the precision, but at that stage you're only at what we call level 3 identification. So the largest database of chemical compounds is PubChem, there's about 83 million compounds, and you have a mass search tool that you can give both a range or an exact mass and you can see what pops out. Obviously, if you're doing mass searches, it's not going to give you the positive or negative ion, so you have to be able to get the, the neutral molecule um, mass. Likewise, with LCMS, you have to make sure that you're giving not an adduct, but again, um, a neutral one. So we search, 
this is what PubChem will give. Um, and uh, some cases it'll list a couple matches. We can be more specific. Uh, we could go to a database like Kebi, which has got about 45,000 compounds. Now, there's a problem um, in using um, resources like PubChem or ChemSpider. And this is that less than 1% of the compounds in PubChem have ever left the laboratory. So 99% of the chemicals in PubChem are essentially synthesized compounds that were made for proof of principle or something like that, or intermediates for synthesis. So they should never ever be found in a biological sample. So by searching through PubChem, you're increasing your odds by a factor of 99 of getting a false positive. So this is important to remember that when you are doing metabolomic searching, choose an appropriate database, if you're especially the, to match by, by mass to charge or MS to MS. And this is, I think, a, a problem that's seen over and over again where people are just searching on, trying to find the largest database to see if they can get a hit and putting down something uh, just to say they've got something. Um, that's not great science. The other thing to do is that you know, if you're looking at, at a human sample, look at a database of human metabolites. If you're looking at an E. coli sample, look at a database of E. coli. If you don't have an exact sample, so if it's a rat or a mouse, probably a human database is okay because in large part they're both mammals and mammalian metabolism is highly, highly conserved. The other thing to do is to watch out for mixed databases where people will combine everything. So Kebi combines everything. So these are just chemicals of biological interest. So some of them are plants, some of them are microbial, some of them are sponges and algae and things that were found at the bottom of the ocean. They're biologically interesting, but they're not something that are going to be found in mouse models or frogs or whatever. So again, Think about what, what your sample is. Now, you can go a little further and you can actually start searching um, not just compound databases, but mass um, databases. So these co complete or collect archival spectral references. So this is for MSMS -MS searching as opposed to parent IMS searching. So Metlin has a large collection of spectral resources. NIST, as we went through, has a large collection. MassBank and MONA. Has anyone heard of MONA? So this is called the Mass Bank of North America, which is actually a consolidation of all of the mass banks in Europe, Japan, and, and others. And they've taken just about every free uh, resource for mass spec and, and put that into MONA. Um, and then there's CFMID, which we'll talk about a little later. Um, so in these cases, you can search for masses, M over Z values, but you can also um, look for addicts. You can do PCLEST search for MS, MS. Um, and this is a much more powerful approach to um, getting mass spectral matching. How do you identify unknowns in mass spectrometry? So this could be both for EIMS and LCMS, and there's quite a bit of effort now to try and come up with ways of predicting mass spectra. So there's a couple of commercial tools. So there's now this freeware tool called CFMID, which was developed in 2014. So it's the only open source tool now that allows you to predict MSMS spectra and just a couple weeks ago, EIMS spectra for GCMS. So that's, it's important. So there's, spectral prediction is different than compound prediction. So this actually does the fragmentation and predicts the fragments and the intensities. Now there's other approaches which will take a spectrum and say, aha, I think it's this compound, which is 
very useful. But it doesn't predict the spectrum to do that. It just simply figures out what fragments might be and what fits with existing data. So if you have tools that can actually predict spectra, um, people can actually help with the novel compound ID. And there's been a couple of papers published in the last couple of months that have used CFMID to do unknown identification based on the LCMS. Uh, because the EMS is just being reviewed right now, um, we'll see how popular it might become. But this is essentially the best route that we can see for doing unknown, unknown identification. Now, it also allows you to identify um, compounds. And so it's been run through a bunch of spec or compound databases, KEG, HMDB, and it has predicted all of the mass spectra for them. So those exist as a library of predicted spectra. MONA also has a library of predicted spectra for about 60,000 lipids. So this is becoming increasingly used where the idea of predicting spectra and putting those spectra online to do the searches to help you identify sort of unknown unknowns where no compound exists will likely ever exist or be synthesized but because we know the structure or likely structure we can predict the mass spectra. What level would that take you to? Would that take you to level two at least? Um, probably two plus or um, it wouldn't be three because you don't have the real compound. Okay. Um, but if you've got parent ion, molecular formula, a good match with your observed MS and a predicted MS MS, and maybe some retention time, I would call that level three, okay. or level two rather. Level um, two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And you could do for biologically, I mean not, could you take from a biological, from an organism actually, or is it still you're inferring from uh, a lab compound, right? Well, what you're dealing with with these things is you can take a list of all known st structures. So an HMDB, which has 42,000 compounds, uh -huh. only about 3,000 of those compounds have authentic MS spectra. <clears throat> but with this, yeah. we can do the other 39,000. Now, they're not going to be perfect. Right. But that's the status that we're at right now, is that only a couple percent of known compounds actually have ever had their MS spectra collected, or MS MS spectra. And that's the way it's going to be for the next 10, 20, 100 years. We're never going to be able to complete that task. So as a community, we have to be able to predict very accurately what those spectra should be to try and get those matches. And I mean, this is an attempt. It's not perfect, but I think over time, as the libraries improve, this uses machine learning, other techniques to develop, uh, it should get progressively better. In the case of lipids, uh, the prediction is very, very accurate. This also does very, very well with lipid or peptides and a few others. So there's certain classes where if we have enough spectra and the behavior is simple enough, it's as good as having the real spectrum. I mean, theoretically, someone like it would be a tool for pride where you could post, you know, you could check your spectra with um, other folks experimentally derived for, That's your, right. for your organism. That's right. Yeah. So, um, anyways, it, it's pretty simple to use. You can choose what you want, whether it's compound identification or spectral prediction. Um, so there's three options, and as I say, it now supports EIMS as well as MSMS. Um, you can upload things. Again, I can't see the screen enough, but uh, fill that in, click and go, and then it, it produces a spectrum and then the match. Uh, the format's been changed, so the match is sort of the mirror image of the observed or whatever. Uh, so you can see the blue and the red lines matching up. It'll give you scores, and, and you can see what, what is appropriate or what's uh, a sufficiently good match. In the case of LCMS, um, there's always the challenge of dealing with salt addicts, neutral loss species, and multiply charged species. So 
a typical spectrum may have 50,000 features, and really what you're trying to do is eliminate a lot of these or consolidate them. So technically, I would call these noise. Um, they're just uninformative, although they still can be useful in perhaps structure determination. So you need to be able to distinguish those addicts or multiply charged species from the parent ions. And again, there's a variety of software tools that can do that. Addict formation depends very much on the chemical structure, depending on whether you have negatively charged groups or positively charged groups, and it'll stick on sodiums or chlorines. And so these are the common addicts that you'll find in LCMS or direct injection MS, um, depending on what solvents you're working with. And addict tables can get very, very large. Oliver Fiend's group has one that they put on their wiki that lists a whole bunch of different addict forms that, that can be seen. Obviously, not everyone is going to be seen in a sample because it's very much solvent dependent and salt dependent. Um, but given those things, you can do that. And then each addict produces both a change in charge and a change in mass. And so again, you can predict based on a formula, chemical formula, chemical structure, what sort of addicts and what sort of masses could be there. Say there's also neutral loss fragments, which will lead uh, to a couple of other uh, peaks from essentially the same compound. Um, and again, that's, that's a challenge of uh, sorting out those ones. So different tools are available. There's tools like MZDB, Metlin, HMDB can handle or predict addicts. Uh, they can predict ion pairs or multiply charged species. Uh, some can deal with a neutral loss species. Um, obviously, if, if you just search by mass to charge, you lead to all these high false positives. If you're able to get the MSMS spectra, that improves it. Likewise, removing the adducts, consolidating things, consolidating multiply charged species, getting rid of or consolidating the neutral losses, or getting rid of fragments, uh, isotope peaks, again, resolving, merging those. If you do that, you can get a, a tremendous simplification. And this is the typical thing that you'll see. So here's a positive ion mode running LCMS. It's not unusual to see 15,000 features. If you remove the adducts, That'll reduce to 12,000, reduce the multiply charged species, you're down to 10,000 uh, or 8,000. Uh, neutral losses um, drop some more. Removing the isotope peaks, you're getting down to 3,000. And then uh, the final spectrum, perhaps 2,500 peaks are considered real. If you repeat that for the negative, you generally get fewer, you might find around 1,500. So from a set that might be a total of 25,000, 15,000 for positive, 10,000 for negative, if you do the proper filtering, you might be only dealing with 4,000 true features. Um, but it, it's, it's challenging to do that. Um, and there are different tools like MZMIME that can do that, Metfusion, Magma, those help. Now the other thing to, to do, especially with very, very high resolution mass specs, like the Orbitrap and the FTMS or some of the better QTOFs, um, you can, once you've consolidated things, you can start pulling out the parent ion mass fairly easily. And in this case, it's possible to use both the parent ion mass and the isotope <coughs> features from that peak to calculate the molecular formula. And so that's a level four level, well probably, yeah, level three, level four identification. So there's a tool, a web server that's been around for a while called MZDB, uh, based in Wales, that, that uses basically the seven golden rules developed by Oliver Fiend to calculate molecular formulas. So it's a web server. Seven golden rules is available by from the Fiend group, but as a, I think as a, an Excel program. Um, you can find compounds by molecular formula, so that's something you can do by PubChem and many other uh, tools. But again, the same caution, the same caveat that um, only 1% of the compounds in PubChem are, are actually biologically relevant. So 
if you can use accurate mass as well as isotopic patterns, and remember those patterns we showed with chlorobenzene and other things, as well as certain t rules about how chemicals must bond and valency, the Lewis and Senior rules, you can greatly reduce both the number of possible formula and the likely compound set. And this is the principle behind the seven golden rules with, with Oliver Fien. How many people have heard of the seven golden rules? Okay, not many. So after today, all of you will have heard about it. But this has been a real important development for mass spectrometry and metabolomics, and it allows you to get, at least for small molecules, fairly reasonable uh, formulas and reducing the number of possible formulas. So in the case for unknown unknowns, this is often all we can do. Um, in the case of just looking at molecules that have carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, and phosphorus, and based on the molecular weight cutoff of 2,000 Daltons, there's 8 billion different possible chemicals that can be created. Um, if you apply a few more rules, uh, that 8, 8 billion can be reduced to about 600 million. Remembering that PubChem has 83 million, um, and PubChem includes a lot of compounds with chlorine, fluorine, bromine, and so on. So that's still quite a few more. Um, and then there's also the isomers. But this just shows you from the space in gray to the space in red to the tiny dot to the invisible dot in terms of the, the size of chemical space that you're dealing with. But just from formulas alone versus the number of compounds that we actually have structures for. And an even tinier number that have actual mass spectra. This also plots out the, the frequency with molecular formulas based on the mass. So small molecules have a small number of possible formulas. Large molecules have a very large number, and so this goes up linearly. So you're, the larger your molecule, the more likely you can have different, very different formulas or very, very, very different structures. If you have better mass accuracy, the number of possible formulas is greatly reduced. And this, again, just illustrates this. So if you've only got you know, 10 ppm or 5 ppm accuracy, as you climb up in terms of the number of, of uh, or the size of the molecule, uh, you don't have very many unique compounds. So if you're just using um, molecular formula, molecular paradigm mass, um, and given today's resolution of about 1 ppm, as soon as you get up to about 500 Daltons, you're, you're looking at, at 20 possible formulas. But if you use the isotopic abundance uh, and you have good resolution with that, then you can drop that set of 20 down to a few. So adding additional pieces of information, including the isotope patterns or isotope abundance, really can make a difference in terms of zeroing in on that, that molecular formula. And this is what some of these um, <coughs> programs allow you to do. So this is just illustrating a very large molecule, uh, but how the isotope abundance from this um, particular mass spec allowed them to, to resolve it. So as I mentioned before, this issue of, of what mass databases, what chemical databases you use is really important. Um, so a lot of people have just been using things like PubChem and ChemSpider and basically getting nonsensical hits and reporting that. If you know the source organism, use that information to limit your source. And that can profoundly limit what you are likely to see, but also greatly improve the hits. So if your formula set is instead of out of 83 million, as this is done for here, but instead it's out of 10,000 or 20,000, then you can be almost certain you're going to get a unique hit or a unique match. Um, so um, now if you don't see anything, then assume it's simply an unknown unknown. And rather than trying to scrape below the bottom of the barrel and report sort of uh, nonsense data. So try to use organism-specific or theme-specific or biofluid-specific um, databases um, that, that greatly improves your, your 
reliability and your odds of, of having having matches and, and having those ones confirmed. The other thing that I, I guess, at least with LCMS versus what I was showing you with NMR and GCMS, which are can be and routinely are quantitative, most MS, LCMS studies are not quantitative. So to get absolute quantitation, you have to use isotopic standards, typically. Um, and it either has to be the authentic compound or something close to it. But there are some other tricks where you can use selective isotopic labeling, which also gets around this. So you can use techniques called reaction monitoring. So there's single reaction monitoring, multiple reaction monitoring that allows you to, to get correct compound identification. Uh, and it's also being used to help with compound quantitation. So that's actually being used in commercial kits now. Um, one of them is called the Biocrates kit. I don't know how many of you have ever used or heard of those. One or two or three. Um, and this is a really cool concept because it makes metabolomics also much more routine. If you've ever done molecular biology, everything is done in kits now. In the old days, it used to be you'd have to clone your own DNA polymerase and clone your own um, uh, restriction enzymes, and it would take months. Now you just buy all the stuff, and it's actually in a little kit, and you can do hundreds of these things. This is the same concept. And uh, with that, you can run it through and, and actually measure metabolites from concentrations as low as 10 nanomolar to about 10 millimolar. So huge concentration range, and about 180 different metabolites. Um, and you can process up to 100 samples in about a day. So it's, it's very efficient, very quantitative, and it includes a lot of the isotopic standards that you would want to, 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 to get that quantification. Um, there are other kits that are emerging. Um, Tabulomics Innovation Center has a few that are online. People can get... I think there's uh, Shimadzu, I think, is starting to sell kits. So this is just, it's, it's a trend, I think, in metabolomics. And it's very targeted, but it gives you quantitation, it gives you consistency, it becomes routine, and the data is reproducible from one year to the next to the next. It's a lot of QC that's involved in preparing these kits. And if you want to be able to move metabolomics from just sort of a curiosity science thing to something that's actually useful in the clinic, in the field, this is something that, that's going to have to be done. So I think it's time for our lunch break. Um, so um, I guess we'll wrap up.